Welcome to the Lymphoma Research Foundation's Caregiving for a Loved One with Lymphoma webinar. I'm Nikki, and I'll be the operator for today's call. During today's call, you will hear from an expert speaker and an LRF ambassador, and you will have the opportunity to ask questions. If you have questions during today's presentation, you can ask them during any time in the Q&A box on the webinar. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. At the end of the program, a link will appear on your screen. Please follow this link to complete an evaluation of this program and gain certification of attendance. If you are listening by phone, this link will be sent to your email at the end of the webinar. And now, I'm pleased to introduce Jesse Brown. Jesse Brown is the Associate Director of Patient Education at the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Welcome, Jesse. Thank you, and thank you to each of you for taking the time to join us on today's Caregiving for a Loved One with Lymphoma webinar. We'd like to briefly thank our sponsors of this webinar, AstraZeneca, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Pharmatech Lakes and Janssen, and Seattle Genetics. Before I turn the program over to our first speaker, I want to briefly share some information with you on the Lymphoma Research Foundation. Access to expert disease information is so important, and we're thrilled to be able to bring you this educational program. LRF is the nation's largest nonprofit dedicated exclusively to lymphoma. Our mission is to eradicate this disease through investment in the most promising lymphoma research and to serve those impacted by lymphoma through quality education and support opportunities. As we continue to make progress in advancing lymphoma research, we also want to ensure that you have access to the latest information about your disease. The foundation provides comprehensive disease and treatment specific resources programs and services, all of which are offered free of charge and have been reviewed by lymphoma experts. Most relevant to today's call, LRF offers a variety of lymphoma-specific resources, many of which you can access at the bottom of your screen if you're utilizing the web link or via LRF's website at lymphoma.org. The LRF helpline can answer your specific questions about lymphoma as well as discuss relevant treatment options and clinical trials. We also offer the Lymphoma Support Network, which is a one-to-one -one peer support program for people with lymphoma and their caregivers. We offer a variety of publications that have been reviewed by lymphoma experts to ensure you have access to the latest lymphoma information. Our mobile app, Focus on Lymphoma, is an award-winning app that provides patients and caregivers access to comprehensive content as well as unique tools to help manage your disease. Finally, we've recently launched our COVID-19 Learning Center to support lymphoma patients and caregivers through this challenging time. Please visit our Learning Center for access to webinars, articles, and other resources specific to COVID-19. I really hope you'll take advantage of some of the great resources and services that LRF provides. If you have questions regarding what you heard about today or if you need information about relevant treatment options and supportive care resources, you can reach out to the LRF through our website at lymphoma.org or by calling our helpline at 1-800-500-9976. We have a wonderful program planned for you today, and I'm honored to introduce Dr. Thomas Haberman. Dr. Hoffman is a professor of medicine at Mayo Clinic in Rochester and former chair of the Lymphoma Research Foundation Scientific Advisory Board. In addition, he has served as an expert speaker and chair on numerous patient and professional programs for LRS. Thank you so much for speaking at our program today, Dr. Haberman. I'll now turn the talk over to you. Thank you so much, Jesse. It's a privilege to be here with you and Chris today for the topic of caregiving for a loved one with lymphoma. These are disclosures or roles that I've, uh, I've played throughout my career. We started a database in lymphoma in 1986 that has over 40,000 patients. I've been involved in cooperative group grants. We have a SPORE grant since 2002. I've been involved in the National Clinical Trials Network. We have a LEO consortium. I'm on the NCCN Guideline Committee and I've had these different roles in the Lymphoma Research Foundation, which is a remarkable organization. Learning objectives for my part of the presentation today are a brief overview of lymphoma, then talk about communicating with the healthcare team during the pandemic and, and communicating regardless of the pandemic, and then practical tips for caregivers. So, when you look at the World Health Organization classification of lymphoma, there are at least 106 different kinds of lymphomas. About half of them are B-cell lymphomas, and then as you can see, there are other kinds of, 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 of non-Hodgkin's lymphomas and Hodgkin lymphoma. Hodgkin represents only five of those. The T-cell neoplasms represent 34. 
We looked at the National Cancer Database, which has data on over on almost 600,000 patients, and in that database, there were essentially a third of the patients as having diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, 17% follicular lymphoma, 8% marginal zone lymphoma, 4% mantle cell lymphoma, and you can see peripheral T-cell lymphoma is 1.7% and others. So the disease is complicated. I think as caregivers, it's really important to understand that, how complicated the disease is. And then when you look next at treatment, this is a, a slide we put together which outlines the 72 years of lymphoma treatments. And it started in 1949 with nitrogen mustard. Methotrexate came along uh, the year I was born, 1953. If you go down and then you come to 2011, look at how many drugs have been developed since that time. And it has really been an incredible time, an incredibly complicated time, but there's the outcomes are improving significantly. So we started with a chemotherapy era, the bar on the bottom, then targeted therapy, rituximab came along to start that era, and then immune therapies. Treatment has been and will be defined by clinical trials, biologic observations, cohort observations, real-world observations, other risk factors, genomics, and all of this is quite complicated. And as caregivers, to help support uh, your loved ones and people you're involved with, uh, friends and so forth, uh, to be participate in these kinds of endeavors will only move the field forward and really provide even more hope. I'm just going to talk a few minutes about the most common lymphoma, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. I mentioned it represents a third of the lymphomas in the United States. RCHOP21 is the standard of care, and I had the privilege of chairing the North American study back in the 1990s, and RCHOP21 is still the standard of care. And we know now that we can cure 65 to 75 percent of patients with their disease. And we've also had other observations that we've made uh, in our SPORE grant, actually, and, and, and in putting other trials together, demonstrating that if a patient is alive and has not been retreated at 24 months, then there's a survival that's equivalent to the age and sex match population. The Progression-free survival, or PFS24, means it was determined by scans, and the EFS24, or event-free survival, means it was determined without scans. However, in primary refractory disease, the outcomes are, have not been good at all. But what's really happened, and I think to provide hope, and I think as a caregiver uh, and as a physician, I've tried to never take away hope, and these results in CAR T-cell therapy, which are now finally reality uh, in, in the last five years, uh, show that the outcomes are, are really changing significantly. See that SCHOLAR-1 study, uh, the median survival of 6.2 months or with a complete remission rate of 7% of that would have been that any kind of care patients were given, that's data we, we, we participated in. Then along came the three CAR t trials, and now over half the patients essentially are, are alive at, at, at beyond 12 months, and uh, these look like they are very durable remissions long term. So things are really uh, changing, and this is likely going to replace uh, peripheral blood stem cell transplant in diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. Even more mind-boggling is there are essentially four drugs that have been FDA-approved since June of 2019, and these drugs, are, the activity uh, is really quite remarkable. And so there's tremendous hope for patients who have relapse or refractory diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and these agents are also being utilized in other kinds of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Follicular lymphoma is not a curable disease, but patients in data that we 
had, in collaboration with the French, reported that 80% of patients are alive at 10 years after any kind of management. Uh, that world has really changed dramatically, and patients are living a long period of time now. Even though not cured, they can be treated with other regimens and, and have multiple treatments uh, as opposed to diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which is more complicated. I won't go through the different, the different therapies, but rituximab changed the natural history of this disease. Uh, CAR T cell therapy was just approved this year, and there's a tremendous amount of research going on here improving the outcomes of this disease. Mental cell lymphoma is a disease that we used to say had a median survival of, of three years a, a decade ago. Now patients are living 10, 15 years and longer. And again, we have CAR T cell therapy just approved, and we have other regimens. And there are now about 5,000 patients who are in international studies addressing uh, very critical questions in treatment with ibrutinib and that class of drugs, the BTK inhibitors, addressing the role of auto stem cell transplant and addressing other roles of other drugs. And so, again, tremendous hope and, and uh, opportunities. What about the, the second goal of this presentation, the communication with the healthcare team? And this also includes during the pandemic, but especially these apply to the pandemic. And I've essentially put these comments on most of these slides that follow now together and from they're very experiential. But as a general principle guideline, everyone's busy. You and your loved ones are busy. Uh, physicians are busy, their care teams are busy, we are all working differently. Physicians are multitasking and not sitting at computers most of the day, at least in our field. With regard to the appointments, a, a limitation on numbers allowed, um, it's, gonna, it's getting re reactivated just this week as we speak with the Delta variant of the COVID-19 moving through the country. and. Oftentimes, in many institutions, only one individual is allowed to come in uh, to the office, and I would encourage consistency and rotation. Uh, one person can't be doing it all, uh, but try to keep some consistency. Phone calls. Uh, this is the contact team members. Usually, it's nurses uh, and other healthcare uh, team members, uh, and one point I would make is that there needs to be uh, permission uh, uh, documented in the healthcare record that they can talk to you as a healthcare, uh, uh, as a as a caregiver provider, uh, and not the patient. We can talk to the patient, but we need permission to talk to you. Electronic communications, the Epic and other uh, uh, electronic medical records have changed the world. Uh, you have direct access to us now in in-basket communications. We get a large number of them. We try to respond as quickly as we can. These are secure mechanisms. The issue with email is that it's not as secure, and most healthcare systems uh, very much prefer that you stay within the uh, system if possible. Telehealth and telemedicine has really changed and really been a, a remarkable, uh, and I think it's going to be here for a much longer period of time than people predicted. So I would just have these suggestions. Uh, number one, be on time. If you're 10 minutes late, uh, the appointment may be canceled. Uh, number two, with regard to electronic device, uh, set up in a comfortable environment. I've done these, and patients have not really set up in a comfortable environment. And provide easy access to your records. So uh, don't be sitting in a corner in a chair with no table and things and, and not be able to, to get access to your records and, and have access to, to your written questions. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. No one is an expert. We have all made so so many mistakes 
And I'd love to share a quote by Niels Bohr, a very famous physicist who some of you may recall the Bohr principle. But I keep this quote above my desk, which reads, an expert is a man who has made all the mistakes which can be made in a very narrow field. And certainly these uh, electronic uh, approaches are very narrow fields. Next, it's helpful to have someone with you, a caregiver, as someone with you as a patient, but the caregiver to help with technology issues, especially. And it's good to have the caregiver, you as caregivers, introduce yourselves in the background so we can see your face just initially, and then we understand how we can connect, connect your name, your face, and your voice. I just did uh, one of these 48 hours ago, and all of a sudden there are a couple of voices coming out of nowhere, uh, and it, it, it just is awkward. Understand that some physicians and healthcare providers spend considerable time going over medical records before the meeting, but others may not. There are time issues, there are a lot of issues. And understand that the healthcare team may be going through your records on the computer while com communicating with you. Um, I'm actually typing when I do some of these, uh, trying to get the note uh, put together correctly. I can't stress enough how important it is to prepare notes and questions ahead of time. You will likely not remember your questions and comments during the visit without these. I've taken care of over the 36 years some very brilliant people, uh, very successful people, very smart people, very uh, people who not necessarily gone through and have PhDs or, or law degrees, but uh, the high school educations who are very brilliant. But when you sit in, in that office, it, it's hard to remember the questions you really want to ask. So what to do in the pandemic? For one, get vaccinated. Two, we need to get back to social distancing, the six feet and hygiene, 70% alcohol, and if you're washing your hands with soap and water, it's 20 seconds. Masks, stay at home when you, when, when you don't need to be out and about, and screen anyone who is sick. Lastly, I want to just talk about practical tips for caregivers, and I call these the R's. Uh, reflections on 36 years of experience, realize resources, resiliency strategies, and the reality of the day. I can't stress enough the two bullets. I asked this so, so many times uh, over my whole career, you know, what can I do when I'm seeing a patient and caregivers sitting in the room and can come from males or females, spouses, uh, relatives, children, and the two word, phrases that I use is, quote, just show up, quote, be present. And some of us want to be fixers and and a little more than we should be in these situations, but it's also important that 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 we ask of each other and realize that some may not want to burden you as a caregiver, uh, but really be careful to, to reach out as much as you can. This concept uh, we've tried to write about, we've tried to study, but it's important for you and the patient to understand that this is harder on the spouse, the child, the, or other caregiver than the patient themselves which to me has always been very counterintuitive, but there's so much truth to this. And everybody needs to understand that, and especially the patient. But but accept that yourselves as a caregiver and understand that, because there's really a, a certain sense of, of helplessness. I just saw a social worker who I've been seeing as a patient has gone through a very complicated course, and we discussed these issues, and she, you know, feels the same way, uh, not only as a social worker dealing with these in her career, but now going through it herself. Utilize resources. So Lymphoma Research Foundation, that's why you're here today. Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, Cancer Care, Institutional. 
how do you do it, social services. But, but really what I've found really fascinating over time is networking and friends. It's amazing how people find stuff for you. And the Internet now can be uh, it can actually be helpful. It can be certainly a nemesis at time during some of these, uh, these things. But uh, the friends and networking are really important. Lastly, help uh, the resilience strategies that you can help with. Um, so communication. Um, some people just want somebody there but not talk much. Some want to talk. Going on walks, getting patients to exercise facilities and exercise classes, transportation to religious facilities. So, so our faith and our physical uh, status are really important. Reading materials, I can't tell you how important that is to some patients. Lastly, I think a, another area that, that we don't talk about much is help meet the needs for hobbies. So painting, woodworking, and just things that people can be doing at home. Uh, you can't believe how much that means to patients at times. So the reality of the day is that we're now into long-distance caregiving more than we ever used to be. We've always been in it. But it's important to provide emotional support. Uh, there's, If you're directly involved, then to inform other family members, help with medical appointments, to help with prescription refills, those two are really important. Help with insurance issues and the, the pragmatics of daily life. Uh, help coordinate food and groceries and issues around the house and property. So getting the lawn mowed, getting the snow taken care of. Uh, each of these are important and each of these are to depend upon where the patient is in the course of the disease, other comorbid comorbid conditions and other uh, issues. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I look forward to the question and answer period. Thank you so much, Dr. Hopperman. Um, we'll get started right in on our second speaker. I am honored to introduce um, a longtime LRS ambassador, Chris Zavodowski. Chris is going to talk with you all a bit about his experience being a caregiver for his father, who is a lymphoma survivor and also uh, an LRF ambassador. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse and Doctor. It's great to be here with both of you today and uh, everybody listening. It's always an honor to share our story um, and be involved with the Lymphoma Research Foundation uh, events. So let me dive right in here. Uh, first, I'll just share my story with everybody. And as I'm talking through everything today, um, some of these things might be common sense, uh, but uh, hopefully some of these things are reminders for you as well, um, everybody out there, or just to give you permission to say, give you a kick in the butt to, hey, I should be doing some of these things. And some, of, it's actually great to see the, the first segment we just had to see how, how um, the doctor's point of view connects with the caregiver's point of view, because there's some great overlap in some of the things I have in my slides as well. But uh, as long as you can get one thing out of everything I'm talking about here, um, I consider it a win, but there's a lot of great resources and stuff we have here. I'm going to share it from my point of view and my story and uh, our family's journey. Everybody I know approaches this differently and has their own different ways of approaching cancer and, um, and going through that journey and, and coping with it. But uh, some of these things have definitely helped our family and also um, several other people that I've been able to uh, to support um, now being involved with the Lone Research Foundation and a lot of family and friends and people have now come to me about cancer related things and caregiving and resources, just like the networking um, the doctor was just talking about. So uh, first off, our story, uh, how we got started was my dad it, back in 2008 was diagnosed with a very rare, very aggressive lymphoma. Uh, called peripheral T-cell lymphoma, to which this day there is still no standardized effective treatment for it. So his best chance of uh, survival, every expert we talked to said, was to go into a clinical research study. And fortunately, uh, one was available to him at NIH uh, here in the D.C. area where um, we live. And he went into that and across the year of 2008 had about 650 hours of treatment um, using protocols they don't even use now. Um, but at the end of that, he beat the odds and was not only cancer-free, um, he's still alive today, and they consider him cured 
from uh, this cancer. His, his team has basically said, now we'll talk about that powerful word in a little bit um, in, my, uh, in my presentation, but here he is today, still alive, and he's actually a Lymphoma Research Foundation ambassador too. So if you go to the website, you can read his story. If anybody out there has a connection to PTCL, uh, you can kind of find out his point of view and what he went through, and he's done videos and all those different things you can find on the Lymphoma uh, Research Foundation channels. But um, very happy that uh, we were able to go through that. You can see we had a sense of humor, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later on uh, here um, when we went through the journey, because there were obviously some dark days. Um, here he is after he, you know, all the hair went off um, and baby Chris picture. And then uh, here he is with uh, hair restored with uh, mom, another big, big caregiver. Talk about leaning on other people out there too. Um, to help you and help make a difference. She obviously was, a because uh, she was living with him um, through it 24-7 and I was not, uh, she was able to to help him a lot. Um, throughout the entire journey, I was, a, fortunately, because I have my own company uh, and, and what I do offline, um, I was able to be there with him for basically every doctor's visit and all the treatments, and, and we were able to go through it as a as a, a, a pair and have a great family support, but it's because we were able to share our journey. So jumping into managing stress and coping as a caregiver, one of the important things, um, which has been a theme today, is to connect with others. Having other people that, even if you're not a person that likes to talk about things and likes to hold it in, this is a type of journey when you're dealing with something that can be life-threatening that it is it is important to share it with other people. It is important to uh, to lean on other people, um, and it doesn't mean that you uh, you're any weaker for for sharing your story. And in many ways, on getting rid of that burden um, and getting rid of some of that stress, or just having another ear to listen to, can make a big difference. And now more than ever, even in the midst of a pandemic, there are so many resources, so many ways you can plug into other people. Uh, there are support groups and events. Um, I know the world we're in right now, some of the in-person support groups aren't happening the same way, but there are plenty of, um, when, when we're in a normal year, there are, are plenty of cancer groups that happen all over the area. I know churches host them. I know cancer organizations host them. And there are many of, of virtual ones now that you can join online um, from Facebook groups to, uh, to forums where you can be sharing your story with other people and be connecting with other people. But that sense of connection makes a, a big difference when you're going through this journey. So we have online, uh, mentioned in person. And then also, um, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the LRF uh, resources that Jesse mentioned at the beginning, because I've seen firsthand uh, at many of the Lymphoma Research Foundation live events how these resources have literally changed people's lives, or in some cases, helped to save people's lives. And uh, the LRF Helpline is an amazing free resource out there that pretty much if you've got any question um, under the sun related to lymphoma, their awesome staff there can answer it for you. You can drop an email in, you can call, and it's not just for patients. Caregivers can reach out too and ask questions. And um, some of the things I'll be talking about here, if you need more clarification about them or you just want to know what you don't know, this is a fantastic place to start. Um, I've seen this team help people at the events before where people felt so helpless, felt like they didn't know what to do, they didn't feel like they were with the right doctor, they didn't know where to turn, and I watched the team help put them in touch uh, right in front of me, you know, with the right doctors, the right people, or point them in the right direction, and it's a fantastic resource. So leading into great organizations like the Lymphoma Research Foundation um, and their helplines is, uh, is, I think, kind of an essential part of, of the journey for, for people going through uh, going through this. And talking with others um, gives you strength, uh, whether or not you realize that it will give you strength. But one of the important things that I realize now and my family has realized sharing our story is that it gives other people strength too. The more that you talk about your story and share, with, um, share, you'd be amazed at how many other people out there have been touched by cancers, have been touched by blood cancers, uh, and uh, are actually inspired by what you're going through, whether or not you feel like you're handling it well. Um, you'd be amazed how much just talking with other people and, and letting them know you're going through helps to, to um, put their world in perspective or just to give them strength if they're eventually touched by, by this disease. I was talking with um, somebody earlier this week, uh, actually yesterday, um, in the, the cancer world, and we were talking about how so many people, uh, when we share our stories now, have a story themselves about how they've been touched by blood cancer and by lymphomas, um, where maybe five years ago they weren't, but they're like, you know what, I have someone in my life now that's dealing with it. So uh, sharing your story is important for not just you, but for other people as well. 
Now, uh, a few other things is to accept help from others. Um, the doctor was talking about this earlier or uh, earlier on as well um, about you know, some of the, the, the ways, the, the practical day-to-day -day things, but there are resources and tools out there now that allow people to do meal trains and to help coordinate things for you. Um, when you go through this, if you're in it now or you're just in it or you know people going through it, you will have everybody saying, let me know what I can do to help, which is, um, which is great. Uh, and they, they just don't know what to do to help. But if there are specific things where you can, you know, you maybe you need your grass mode or maybe you need someone to pick up groceries or help coordinate grocery delivery or food or um, or just take you out for, for the evening uh, and get you away from from the patient and, you know, and just give you a little break. Um, it, it's OK to accept help from others. And if you do need something specific, ask people because everyone in your life will be sending you a message saying, hey, what can I do to help? Um, then the next thing is uh, is to let's see is to do the best that you can, um, and it's sometimes okay to not be. Uh, it's okay to sometimes not be okay. Uh, I know, uh, uh, actually, in the first segment, talking about sometimes it, it is harder on the caregivers. I know we have to put up a, a smiley face and be the the kind of the the shoulder to lean on for every um, for our loved one or the person in our life that we're taking care of. Um, but it's okay to make mistakes, like you heard earlier. Uh, it's okay to not be perfect, and it's okay to have bad days. Um, I know we had, you know, it, while our family, fortunately, were blessed to be very close and um, and have a great extended support network, there were definitely some challenging days, some hard days, and for anybody out there who's um, interacted with some of the medicines that you use in treatment or prednisone or things like that that can change moods and can, um, and, and, and you know, can make things a little difficult at certain parts of the cycles, uh, you know, we dealt with all of that. It's okay to not have a perfect day. Um, so don't put the pressure on that you all, yourself that you always have to be, uh, you know, 100% with everything that you're dealing with. Uh, take care of yourself. This came up a little earlier. Um, these are the common sense parts of things, but just a reminder to everybody that these are important things, especially if you're in a long journey. Some of these uh, lymphoma subtypes, um, you know, ours was a year um we were in the thick of it, then many years of follow-ups and doctors and things after that as well. Uh, it's important as you're in this long haul with lymphoma that you are taking care of yourself. So get get up and move, listen to your body, um, don't neglect your health needs. And if you can give yourself a schedule, that will definitely help to have some normalcy in your life because obviously your life might be getting upended um, with your schedule, but to, to try to carve out some time for yourself to take care of yourself because that will make you ultimately a better caregiver for your loved one. Um, now, finding ways to have fun. Everybody's version of fun is different. Talked about the hobbies for the, the patient and helping them have fun. It's important to have fun together. And it's also important to have fun um, on your own. But however that, whatever that is for you, just I'll give you a few examples um, here. Maybe it's going out to watch a movie. I remember taking my mom out. We'd go to actually see a few things um, uh, when either dad was in the hospital because he'd be hospitalized for five days at a time for his treatment. Um, or we would just I'd take her out for a little bit so she could have a nice little break. Uh, obviously, religious um, things were, were religious as well. Maybe going to church is something that's important to you. Uh, concerts and shows. Um, we actually, uh, fortunately, because of modern medicine, my dad was able to get a day pass from NIH, and he's got a little fanny pack on there, if you can see it with a pump in it, and he would get basically like a, like a hall pass from school where he could go out for the day. So we actually, here we are at the Kennedy Center, I think we were going to see Lion King um, that day with some friends. We did a, a train trip up to New York um, in the midst of his treatment or earlier on uh, in the treatment when he had a little bit more energy in the earlier cycles. Um, and then here's one of his favorites that I could tell people about. We went uh, to see uh, a show at a theater in the D.C. area, and here he is giving uh, Cheetah Rivera a kiss. Um, but you can see the little IV line, the pick line that he's connected up to there. Um, but we still tried to find ways to have some normalcy and some bit of fun in our life. Um, maybe it's just a nice dinner. Um, with the way the world is now and, and you know, uh, compromised individuals, it's probably not going out to a restaurant, uh, but maybe it's having a nice dinner at home or having DoorDash bring you something really nice at home that you can, you can do where you don't have to worry about cooking and you can feel like you're being pampered a little bit too. And I mentioned this earlier to lean on your family, friends, or fellow caregivers. Uh, and to remember to laugh, uh, having a sense of humor is a big one. Um, we'll get into the wigs here in a little bit. Um, but it, whether you're a, a person that likes to laugh or not, you need to find some way to add humor into your life um, because there are certainly some dark days that you'll you will experience this. And just taking it one day at a time, 
playing the what if game and what might the future hold and, and, and uh, all of that, you can go down a dark road with that, but just going, what, what's next? What's right in front of me right now? What can I do today? What can I do tomorrow? Not what do I have to worry about three months down the road? Um, will we'll definitely help when you're going through some of this. Now, here's some practical, this is not an exhaustive list, but I want to give you a few actual resources and tools that you can put into your, um, into your toolbox to, as you're going through this as a caregiver. And they, some of these dovetail also with what uh, the doctor was talking about in the first half. Um, first one is to be your loved one's best advocate. Now, my dad, it took a long time for them to actually diagnose what he had. And it should have been caught earlier by do local doctors uh, or by do other doctors, but there were people that didn't know what they were looking at. We weren't dealing with specialists. The right pathologists weren't looking at his slides. Uh, and there were month literally months um, lost. I mean, he was, he was stage four. It was throughout his entire body, in his bone marrow, metastasizing um, bones, in his blood. Uh, he was knocking on death's door whenever he got diagnosed. Um, and so we were doing everything we could to get to the right people. And it's really important that you uh, don't ever settle, uh, that you make sure that you understand everything, that you, um, you, you should ask all of the questions. Um, and, and just because, and I realized this with multiple other illnesses he's had over the years um, and that my family's had actually for my mom, I helped him play caregiver for her too for some things, that just because someone has doctor in front of their name doesn't necessarily mean that they know 100% of what they're dealing with in, the, in, in certain uh, instances, and especially in the lymphoma world with now over 100 different subtypes uh, classified out there. You need to make sure that you're getting to a specialist. This is where the helpline um, that LRF has really can make a difference. But you want to make sure you're talking to somebody that knows what they're dealing with, that, you're, you're inter that they're working with a pathologist that knows what they're looking at, um, and that's somebody that is skilled, especially in this world, because the local oncologist, at least in our situation, you know, if she sees one peripheral P-cell lymphoma patient uh, every few years, that would probably be a lot for her. So she just didn't even, and didn't even know that that's what it was. Um, but I think it, it, I, this, is, um, this has borne out multiple times in many situations that you need to be the best advocate. You need to be the, the person that's pushing um, and, and trying to make sure that you're getting what you need. Ask as many questions as you can. Uh, if you need to call the nurse again, if you need to send another email through my chart or Epic or, um, or whatever you need to do, however you can get your questions answered, it's really important that, um, that this is where I think a lot of energy should really be expended because ultimately, if you're, if you're getting multiple opinions, it helps you and you're really pushing to get the right information. It helps to put together a better care plan uh, and for you to be informed and, and to sleep better at night too. Um, a few of the things right there I just mentioned. Um, I also mentioned always get a second opinion uh, and sometimes maybe a third opinion. Um, in our, our case, when we were able to meet with multiple doctors, we were able to get multiple different things to put together the, the great treatment plan or to have consensus. Uh, but I've interacted with many people in, uh, in the, the, the blood cancer world and the lymphoma world now where um, they might have, the first doctor they interacted with wasn't the best one for them. Uh, and going out and, and Getting a second opinion, a lot of these top uh, organizations, and, and I'm, I'm not sure, we maybe talk about the Q&A, um, I don't know what the Mayo Clinic does, but I know that NIH, that there's, uh, and Johns Hopkins, and a lot of ones in our area all have formalized second opinion um, methods that they can do where they can take all of the information and help to give a second opinion. But I think this is uh, not, not optional at all. It's mandatory for anybody dealing with any type of cancer or, or something that's serious. Uh, I think it's super important, and, and I've, I've seen LRF help people get that second opinion where it really it changed the kind of the road and the, the prognosis for um, what, their, what their loved one was going through. Uh, the next thing is to leverage technology. Uh, we have so much more of it now that we can use that we didn't have before, and we still used a lot of before, but there's even more now. And, of course, with the last year and a half or, uh, you know, however long we're going to be in the, this virtual world, of more virtual world of things, even more important. Something that was really important to us, that was really helpful, um, and we uh, say he was talking about uh, Dr. Haberman was talking earlier about the the virtual uh, visits that we're having a lot now, and making sure you have all your questions and and taking notes and everything. Something that that has saved us many times is to record doctors' visits. Now, always ask permission when you do this, uh, but in every single instance, we've never had a doctor say no. Um, and usually we'll say it's because we want to listen to it later on when you're dealing with this cancer world, there's so much information that gets thrown at you at once. 
and it can be like drinking from a fire hose. The patient, I guarantee you, is not hearing 100% of it. Um, after certain words, their their brain might be going through all the what-if scenarios. They might just not be feeling well enough that day to be fully focused and in it. And then, of course, as loved ones or family members or caregivers, it's hard for us to absorb the thousand things at once when we're asking questions and and. and all this information is coming at us so quickly. So having your doctor's visit recorded, of course, with any smartphone now or recording device, it's really easy to do. And I'll talk about an app that has it built in as well. Um, it allows you to go back later on and re-listen through all these important things that you were told by the doctor or by the, the care team about treatments or options or, or whatever. But that this has always been a really important resource for us, especially in the early days and for other people that um, I, I mentioned that to. Also, get copies of all your test results, including discs. Now, with our virtual world, things are a lot easier to share between doctors, but there have been still times where having a copy of the blood work, having a copy of the scan has expedited what we needed to do to get to the next doctor we were dealing with, the next specialist, uh, a second opinion, whatever the case may be. But you should have a nice folder or uh, something on your hard drive if you're a real tech savvy, something where you have a copy all of, it, uh, of all of it. When we would deal with another doctor, um, usually the first question was, oh, well, we need a copy of what, you know, this, this uh, blood work. We need a copy. Oh, you had a, a, you know, a, a PET CT done already. We need a copy of that. We need a copy of this. And having the two offices work together, you can do that. But like Dr. Haberman was saying earlier, everybody's insanely busy. Um, I can't tell you how many times the nurses or the, the receptionists or whoever were on the phone I was talking to when I said, oh, I've got to copy all that. I can email it to you now. I can fax it to you right now. I can overnight it, whatever, how happy they were um, that all that work was already done for them. But when time matters for something like this and this type of disease, that just helps to save a lot of time. Uh, so for you to have copies of all that is important. And sometimes you might read notes on these reports where you'll notice that something was ordered and a scan wasn't being done right. There were several times where, for some reason or another, a human error happened, and I noticed, like, wait, he was supposed to have this this part, this leg done, or this part of his body scanned, and that wasn't, that you're scanning the wrong thing. And then they looked, oh, yeah, you're right. So you being able to see a copy of these things, too, can ultimately help you make you a better caregiver. You can use apps like Dropbox, uh, OneDrive, um, Dropbox is a free app you can put on, on your device where you, it's actually, you can actually just scan uh, device and scan or take pictures of uh, documents and put them right into PDF and store them digitally if you want to. Or you can just to keep a normal you know, paper copy of everything. And then for disks, you can just ask the facility that did the scan to get a disk. And as long as you're on the, the patient's record and you're able to do that, that's, that's never been an issue. Um, and you can use the shared calendar for medications and appointments. Google Calendar is awesome for this. Uh, if you guys don't use it at all, it's fantastic. It's totally free. This is not our calendar. This is just a, a demo calendar up here on the picture. But um, you can create all these different calendars, and you can color code everything. You can see these little check boxes on the left there. Um, and you can create one for cancer treatment. You can create one for doctor's visits. You can create one like we have a family calendar for different events we're doing together. I have my own personal one. I have my business one. And you can share calendars with other loved ones or the only calendars you want to share. And then you can turn them on and off. So you can ultimately, you can have a master calendar view, but everything can be color coded. So when you have a lot of pills that have to be taken, multiple appointments and scans and tests and all of those things um, that are in your brain that you, you should get them out of your brain and put them in a tool like this. It's fantastic. And it, it, for my dad, uh, practically speaking, I would put all of his medications in this so he would know exactly what pill to take what day, what time to take it. You could set reminders so it comes up on your phone. It's a fantastic tool, especially when you need to be working with other people in your family to, to coordinate so much in your schedule. Uh, and then you can also, you know, schedule in fun things on this too, and you can color code, code it and everything. So it's a great, a great device, great tool to use. Uh, now, the next one is the Focus on Lymphoma mobile app. Now, it's fantastic as it is now. I know they're going through some iterations, and they'll have a new, a new version of it and generation coming down the road. Um, but this is an award-winning, uh, best-in-class app. Right now, it's free. You can get it on, on, on Android. You can get it on I, iPad or iOS. You can get it on all your different devices here. And it's a great app um, for anything related to lymphoma. It's got disease-specific information. 
It, uh, of course, their website always has the latest stuff in it as well, too. You can track schedules. You can set reminders. Uh, you can actually record your doctor's visits in this, and you can connect uh, with people um, as well and connect with LRF to get more information. And then you can get it at lymphoma.org slash mobile app to be able – you can go on there and see the, see the information you need to. Oh, and it's free. So let's go into number four is to make a support book. Now, this is one um, where – uh, you can put together all the great support that's coming in from your life. Um, you'll hear it in multiple places, but rather than just let it be fleeting, uh, you want to keep it uh, in one spot so that your loved one and you can see that. Um, and it's, it's great to something, to something you can look at down the road, cards that you get from people, blog entries if you have a, a website, uh, jokes, uh, prayers that you get from people. Um, I know we had a prayer chain all around the, the world for my dad. Uh, and on every continent, and I had people doing prayers for him, so he put that in. And it's a source of inspiration for many years to come. So um, my dad's name is Rich, uh, so we called him Rich Dad. And here's a little, uh, like a big three-ring binder, actually, we put together and put pictures in it of the early days of his uh, of his journey and had hundreds of pages in there from posts and emails and cards and things, we letters we got from people and just slowly – collected all of that over time so that your loved one can see how much support they have and you can as well. But it's a great thing also to look back on um, periodically too to, to give you a, a source of strength. Uh, now going into our next one here is to get connected and involved. Um, we talked about some of these already, but lymphoma.org, you should be on the mailing list. Most likely you are if you're here already. Uh, there's their website. Ask the doctor events. They're doing virtual ones now when they do them live. They are fantastic events all around the country, totally free. You get to go ask every question you want of a top expert in the lymphoma field. They're a great way to network as well. The annual Ed Forum, the, the long tongue twister titles, North American Educational Forum on Lymphoma. Um, but the Ed Forum, it'll be, it'll be virtual this year again. It's a multi-day multi event covering a to Z, 101, something for caregivers, something for patients, um, the current state of cancer. It's, it's a fantastic. Living with Lymphoma is their new podcast. So you can do podcasts, webinars like this one, and regional events and local groups, and then connect on their Facebook page. Uh, if you're not on there already, um, they have Instagram, and they also have a Twitter page. So I encourage you to connect with um, all of those if you are uh, in, in that world. Um, and then uh, be part of the community and you'll be inspired by the research, the breakthroughs that are happening and the increasingly brighter future. One word that Dr. Hobman said he always wants to leave with people and make sure they have is hope. And there's more hope now than ever. When we got into this world with cancer, the, the, everything was related to um, basically just cancer free. You barely heard the word cured being used when we were coming to these events and in the medical community. And now every time we go to these events, the word cured comes up in so many different presentations. Even my dad now is being called cured where that wasn't a word they wanted to use with this type of cancer years ago. So um, being plugged into things like this will give you so much hope so you can see all the amazing research that a great doctors like Dr. Haberman and everyone else related to LRF and just in the cancer world is doing to help save more lives. Now, number five, uh, this one's a simple one. It's really simple. It's no medical talk weekends. <laughs> so we instituted this uh, in our family and still to this day, um, although dad fights on it a little bit every now and then, we have it actually on our Google calendar still to this day. And it's to give yourself a break from something that can consume your entire life. There were so many medical things happening. We wanted to say, okay, Saturdays and Sundays, we will not talk about it at all. We're going to talk about anything else but bodily stuff, no medical things. None of that is allowed to be talked about. You'd be amazed at how much fun this can end up being, but also having to fill that discussion with other things that you can celebrate that are more uplifting um, can also be a great source of, uh, great source of happiness, too. Uh, speaking of happiness, keep your sense of humor. Uh, I got this from a Parkinson's organization, I think, in Australia. Uh, there'll be the replay of this coming out, so you can go look at the details on this later. Um, but all the chemicals that can be released in your body and the way that you can release them as far as uh, happiness and joy and laughter and the activities you can do can be uh, such a great drug that you can, that's totally free that you should be overdosing on, especially as a caregiver. So find things to laugh about every day. Find ways that you can inject joy and laughter into days that can sometimes be very challenging and very hard like I talked about earlier. Uh, every different cycle my dad went through, I had bought all these different wigs for him, so he had a different character. I made him, uh, he, he, once he started getting laughter, he got into it. This is his surfer dude look. Um, 
We had a Rastafarian look. Uh, here's his doctor, a Dr. Janik, that was <laughs> wearing his hat at that point in time. Um, he had uh, an Afro and then a samurai uh, wig there. There's uh, one of the technicians that was wearing one of his other wigs. Um, here we are uh, acting like we're, we're hardcore thugs, um, having fun with it. Uh, and there's just a nice lo loving picture of mom and dad there um, having a little happiness. And here they are. Um, here we are as a family having gotten through the whole journey uh, and, you know, and healthy and with hair again um, and everything and, and, and with big smiles on our faces because we did all the things I just talked about here and, and shared our story and, and um, kept a lot of love and stayed strong with everyone. Uh, and, and stayed as strong as we could. Now, one note, this was on the uh, LRF Instagram account recently, and I thought it was a great quote I wanted to, to, to share with you here, that cancer is not a death sentence, but rather it's a life sentence, and it pushes one to live. So I challenge everyone here to, to, to really take that to heart and to look at it as a way that how you can have more life uh, rather than less life with whatever you're dealing with right now. And remember, most importantly, you're not an alone, that we are all in this together. Um, while you may feel alone, sometimes you're definitely not alone and staying plugged in to organizations like the Lymphoma Research Foundation events, like the ones they're hosting right now, and, and, and all the different resources that mentioned will, will give you that support so you know that you are not alone. So thank you. Uh, if you want to connect, my website's up there. You can drop me a message through, um, through that page. And thank you, Jesse and Dr. Haberman. I look forward to, uh, look forward to the Q&A. Great. Um, thank you, Chris, and, and thank you, Dr. Hopperman, again. Um, that was great, and I know every caregiver on the call appreciated that talk. Um, just to remind everybody, this will also be archived and posted on our website, so you can go back at a later time and kind of scroll through all these resources as well. And uh, we'll now begin um, just our Q&A portion of the program. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, just submit that through the Q&A box on your screen. And for our first question we got, someone asked, um, I think if you both want to weigh in on this, uh, but we can start with Dr. Haberman. What types of practical advice can you give to caregivers? Should we quarantine with our loved ones? Self-care is tough when self-quarantining. She would love to go to lunch with a friend, but is afraid to bring home uh, the disease COVID-19 to her husband. I'll answer this question as I'm answering it on this very date today, and I must say a couple of weeks ago, I wouldn't have answered it the same way. The Delta variant is really shooting through the country. It's shooting through most countries, and it is a much more virulent virus, a thousand times greater infectivity rate. And so I think that uh, we are uh, moving into a very similar situation we were in, in last year at this time. And so my recommendations are that that we're going to really have to tighten back down. It's going to be imperative that you're vaccinated. Uh, in, in family members who have received a drug like an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody such as rituximab, uh, you don't produce antibodies after that for 9 to 12 months. And so there are very significant issues and, and risks. And so my suggestion right now, and I, this is what I've been doing the last week and a half with patients, uh, and as the story is unfolding uh, daily right now, uh, I think it's going to be important to to, to continue in that more quarantine mode. Uh, and at best, if you're going out to uh, dinner and so forth, to be outside. Uh, mask, keep the six feet to the six foot rule and alcohol uh, on the hands. I, the only thing I would add to that is if you, the only thing I would add to that is if you, because even with my dad and being, you know, higher risk over the last year, year and a half, when I interact with my family, I would limit what I would do in the rest of my life because I didn't want to bring it to them. I would consider, because of where we're headed right now, like the doctor said, any way you could add some, while we might be sick of it now, some virtual aspect to that. If it, if it is a risk to go out to have lunch, then can you both order the same lunch in from your favorite place, make a special date of it, hop on Zoom or hop on you know, FaceTime or something and still have some type of connection, make it as normal as possible, but where you are eliminating the risk completely um, from that interaction. But I... I, I you know, that, that, the only thing I would say is how, how can you adapt it and still have some fun and, and some connection in it, but, um, but it's definitely not, I, I don't think it's worth the risk um, in some situations these days, for, you know, especially for someone who's going through treatment. 
Great. Thank you both. Um, the next question is, uh, someone commented that a June 2020 CDC survey indicated around 31% of unpaid adult caregivers have seriously considered suicide in the past 30 days compared to 11% of all respondents of the survey assessing the heavy mental health toll, um, specifically in the pandemic. Um, you both might have a kind of, you know, different insights, but how can society as a whole provide the necessary support for the care caregiver, not only the, the patient? Um, uh, Chris, do you, do you want to take a stab at that first, or Dr. Hoberman? Sure. Uh, well, I, I, this is where I think that um, because we've been more isolated, especially recently uh, as a society, that this is where I think the connection is even more important. Uh, it, it, you know, and when I talk about sharing your story and talking to other people and communicating with other people or loved ones, especially if there are dark days, I know there was somebody, LRF has the Lymphoma Support Network. Um, there was another organization that has a similar one where I, I was buddied up with. By the way, the Lymphoma Support Network also can pair you up with other caregivers. Uh, so if you need to talk to another caregiver or somebody else going through what you're going through, reach out to them as well. It's not just for patients. Um, but there was one time when I was par part paired, not through LRF, but um, another organization with somebody that was definitely in a situation like that, where they, they needed more help than I was qualified to provide. And I think there are times where people do need to reach out if, they feel, if they're feeling that way, to not be ashamed to reach out to the helpline, which then could re you know, refer them to the right person or reach out to a suicide hotline or things like that if people are having those types of thoughts. Um, but I do think it's something that especially shouldn't be bottled. There's nothing that have to be bottled up and contained right now in our world. Um, but I don't th I think something like that is where it's, it, it's more important to be connected and, and to share. And if you do need to par be partnered up just with somebody else just that's going through what you're going through, reach out and ask for that type of um, thing. But just asking for what you need, I think, is the first step to, to help uh, combat that. This, this statistic is uh, alarming, to say the least. What's really one way to other, another way to think about it this was data that was released uh, in, in June 2020 and the way the world's changed with regard to devices uh, tools such as zoom or ways that people can connect with each other uh, i'm hoping is, is helping with this whole thing uh, to connect with grandchildren to connect with your kids uh, this has been an unbelievably miserable time for most people. And anyone I talk to on 68th and anyone I talk to, we've never seen anything like this. The world, in the, the modern world, has not seen something like this. And um, so I think the things that can be done, as what we're doing here today, education, getting things out there, um, helping provide some other thoughts on how to how to do this, I think Chris articulated a number of things extremely well, but pointing out that caregivers have to take care of themselves too. I'm constantly asking in the hospital and in the outpatient setting, uh, the spouse or the child or whoever's with, it, you know, are you uh, still exercising or did you quit? Are you are you getting some sleep? Uh, and uh, those things, and we really have to encourage caregivers to to take care of self also. Uh, it's a very selfless thing to be a caregiver. As we, we, we both suggest that it's a there's a helplessness to it that, that you really that, that can be very, very profound. Uh, and I think just understanding some of those things I think can really help. Yeah, thank you both for addressing that. I know it's a very difficult question, but an important one. Um, Dr. Haberman, the next question is, is it too late to get a second opinion if your spouse is already in treatment? I don't think it's ever too late to get a second opinion. I've been doing this for 36 years, and I've seen patients at all facets of their disease. I just finished with a patient this morning who finished up and uh, he's he's now 24 months out from treatment with large cell lymphoma, but he wasn't comfortable that his questions were being answered or that he really understood where he was in his disease and, and he didn't understand the issues such as his maintenance therapy indicated in large cell lymphoma and some other questions like that. So I don't think it's ever too late. 
Thank you. And um, Chris, as a caregiver, what was personally the most difficult thing you dealt with and what resources, I know you mentioned a lot of one Della Rep does and some other organizations, but what resources for that did you reach out to um, for support? Um, good question. I, I, the, well, the most difficult thing, um, that's where I, this goes back to where I was talking about taking it one day at a time, was when my dad was diagnosed, like I mentioned earlier, he was, it was stage four. He was knocking on death's door, and we didn't know if he would be there in just a few months blowing out his birthday candles or for Thanksgiving or coming down the steps on Christmas Day. Like, we didn't know if he'd be there by the end of the year because he was so sick uh, and getting sicker and sicker and sicker. So obviously the, the idea of, go, you know, what, what the what if of that is, um, is probably one of the most challenging things. Big picture. Uh, the day-to-day, though, of course, was sometimes when you get into fights or blow-ups or things like that, or, you know, hey, he's got to take a crazy amount of prednisone at the beginning of the cycle and, you know, moods or tensions are going to be high and all of that. Um, that, that obviously, those, uh, that those days could be challenging sometimes. Um, I'd say the biggest number one support was, um, having, you know, with mom, I mean, she was living with them. I was nearby, uh, and with, with them for most of it, um, throughout everything, but le- having somebody to lean on as a caregiver, uh, going through it together made it a thousand times easier. I know everybody doesn't have that. But that's why plugging into like this Lymphoma Support Network or things like that, or when I talk about connecting with other people, finding some sense of that in your life can make such a big difference to have that support. Um, Something else that helped us a lot, and uh, actually I didn't uh, really touch on it too much in my presentation, but um, I, I would say this is really important, is there are resources out there. I know CaringBridge is one of them. Um, You can create your own blog. You can create a private Facebook group. Uh, I, we created, I created a blog for my dad and we did all of our updates there and family and friends could comment, could share jokes, could do la- you know, whatever they could put funny things on it. And that's how we kept everybody updated in one, one, uh, central spot because everybody will keep, how, everybody wants to know what's going on. You're getting tons of texts and emails and questions and you're having to say the same thing over and over again. And that in and of itself can be really tiring. So putting it all in one spot that everybody knows that's where they knows that's where they can go and get the updates from, uh, or we send an email, hey, we put a new update up. That was a great um, great help, but also a great sense of support because we were sharing our journey. We it actually allowed us to leverage how we shared it because we could share it with so many other people uh, at once because it was all in one spot. But then also all the comments and prayers and stuff that my dad would get on there and the emails back we would get and the, all of that was a great sense of support that we could never have gotten just sharing our story one-on-one with um, the people in our network and our family and friends. I know now Facebook has Facebook groups. You can do something that's private on there. And I know someone whose daughter was going through cancer and he created a group on there. And, you know, next thing you know, a thousand of their family and friends are all in there getting updates, posting and, and sharing and connecting um, and caring bridge, like I mentioned about, and there's other ones out there. So I think tools like that uh, were a great sense of support in addition to, you know, plugging into organizations, but finding ways that you have a finite amount of energy, uh, both physical and emotional in your day. And your number one priority other than take, be, besides taking care of yourself is to take care of your loved one. Uh, and things like having to answer the same question a thousand times or, sh- you know, and staying connected with everybody out there one-on-one, that can drain a lot of really important energy or take time from your life that you could, you know, be doing other things. Um, so I, I think using resor- tools like that to kind of help leverage uh, your energy, time, and your day, and also the amount of support you can get really helped. And in our case, definitely helped a, a, a lot for us. So that's just a few a few little things there. Yeah, great. Thank you, Chris. Um, we have time. Uh, if you have time, Dr. Hartman, we have one final question that just came in, and it's, do you have any advice for a caregiver during and after a stem cell transplant? It's a full-time job, especially during the post-procedure quarantine period. Yeah, I live through this regularly, um, and um, the uh, it is more intense, um, and it depends upon how complicated the course is post auto stem cell transplant or allo can occasionally be done. The all of the things that we talked about um, 
take some of those to heart, but it, the, the first advice, and it, this comes from experience, is to just make sure you first take care of yourself. So eating, sleeping, and getting some exercise. The shift thing can really help. So uh, people come in, uh, uh, for instance, if you're transplanted in Rochester, you need to stay here. Uh, in most most institutions, you need to stay locally for a period of time. And so someone will come in for a week. Someone else will come in the next week. Um, that can re that that probably we didn't really talk about that as I recall in any of the slides or discussion. Uh, that is a practical tip uh, that that's really helped, uh, and it also helps the patient because there's someone different around and and same story every day. The uh, 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 other than that, other than that, is added to what we've already talked about, but. Most importantly, being keenly aware of your own situation too. It's an intense time. Uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel, <laughs> and so that's the good news. Great, thank you, Dr. Hobman, and uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, you guys were really wonderful today, um, and I know everyone on the call uh, really appreciated this this time. So I'd also like to thank everyone who joined us on today's call. Uh, we hope you found the information both informative and hopeful, and you'll utilize some of these resources that Dr. Haberman and, and Chris both mentioned. Uh, we'd also just like to thank our sponsors one more time again for making this program pro possible, AstraZeneca, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Pharmacyclics and Janssen, and Seattle Genetics. Please remember if you have any additional questions or you'd like to be connected with someone else who has been impacted by lymphoma um, or another caregiver, you can reach out to the LRS helpline at 800-500-9976. Uh, at the conclusion of this program, you'll receive an email prompting you to complete a program evaluation. Uh, we hope you please take a few moments to complete this as they are very important for helping us to ensure we deliver the most useful and meaningful programming to you. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for uh, joining us and have a wonderful day.